been a dreamer. I can remember having many growing up here in New Jersey. As a child, I would daydream about the big dreams of having my career as a broadcast journalist and actually creating a family of my own. But I actually had a few dreams of actually doing a TED Talk. So, but never in my wildest dreams would I imagine doing one in a very area where my husband lost his life. When I lost Brian, my dream became a nightmare. On November 29, 1999, a single gunshot wound to the face took the love of my life. Ironically, in a place that he dreamed of. It was his record store. He always, always wanted to own it. His friend accidentally shot him. It was a moment that changed my life. The decision was they were trying to figure out how they actually operate in, the sh in their store got robbed. And unfortunately, that mock robbery, that act, it changed my life, changed my status. At 25 years old, I became a widow. I had a status that my friends couldn't relate to and that my family, well, they never dealt with. We were only married for two months. As a matter of fact, three weeks before we were to wed, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. So, for a 17-year-old fight, actually just ended two months ago. And so I stand here talking about the foundation as I actually agree to get another major loss in my life. But as a former television reporter and news, news director, turn happiness researcher, I can honestly talk about how I was able to come up with five life lessons that really helped me navigate through. You know, when I lost Brian, I was actually living my dream job in, in Philadelphia. And I remember so, so openly when, when he was, I was going through that loss, that when he was working as a popular hip hop DJ here in the area for actually a popular radio station in Philadelphia. When I lost him, I couldn't listen to music for over a year. Matter of fact, I couldn't even listen to it in my car. I didn't even hum a tune. It was actually just that painful. I remember I would take showers and they were very long showers because I wanted to really wipe away the tears. So one of the first lessons that I learned as it related to getting through loss was finding support. And I found it in a therapist. I met with her weekly and we talked about my loss and we talked about how to cope. But then I also found it by looking and reading various books. And one thing I wanted to do was to find out more information as it related to loss. I found it in books that helped me talk about and learn about loneliness and renewal, but I was in my 20s. And I wanted to actually find out more about young widowhood. I was able to find that support online. And science actually supports this. Matter of fact, science says that when you are trying to search for support, you do so in regards to developing different groups and inter internet support groups. So actually a few scholars out of the University of Delaware and Hampton University actually did some research on this topic. They interviewed 21 respondents between the ages of 30 and 50, and they found that about 85% of them gravitated towards internet support groups because they wanted to connect with people with similar experiences. The second most reason was emotional support. They wanted to actually connect with people who were empathetic. They wanted to be with people who simply got them. And I could relate to that. It's clear that as humans, we search for connection, understanding, but more importantly, to cite a fellow TEDx speaker and scholar, someone who I admire greatly, Dr. Brene Brown, 
We search for empathetic understanding. So as I went through the process of grieving the loss of my husband, I began to think about meaning. I began to cover stories differently as a reporter. At the time, my news director actually would assign me to cover stories. I dealt with a lot of tragedies and loss. He knew I would cover it with more empathy. And when I was a news director myself, I always thought about what can I do to make the lives of my news team better? I wanted to see my talk show hosts and producers live their best life. And then that grew into how can I make the world better? And so I decided to get, actually get my PhD at the University of Florida. And I ended up studying positive psychology, the science of happiness, and meaningful work. And in that journey, I found that my second life lesson, well, is all about following your passion and your purpose. Meaningful work scholars pose this question, why am I here? And when you're trying to map out meaning, you're looking in terms of how to express your full potential, developing inner self, unifying with others, service to others, work that you hope is going to serve the greater good. Work that you hope is your calling. For me, meaningful work actually comes in a lot of forms. It comes in terms of the fact that I joined the positive psychology movement to help people flourish and work in life. And I also see it. I see it in the journalists and executives that I coach to help them with well-being and happiness at work. I also see it in all the mentees that I have all over the world that are showing off and taking over with their gifts and their talents. And I also see it in my students that are thriving in my classroom at Georgia College. See, greatness can still be achieved through loss and grieving. J.K. Rowling wrote the magical pages of Harry Potter after the loss of her mother. And I also see it in a dear friend and colleague, a fellow journalist, Tanisha Bell. Tanisha is a former network TV executive turned media entrepreneur. Now she's making headlines because of her personal narrative. Tanisha lost her father at four years old. He was murdered. He was murdered by youth in Chicago. The ages of those young men that shot him were 15, 19, and 21. Yet she turned her adversity into the ultimate form of altruism. Tanisha has created a scholarship fund in honor of her father to help youth all over the country. Her work is giving opportunities to so many youth that may not have had it, which brings me to legacy. You know, Stephen Covey, he told us to always think of the end in mind. Now, that can seem a little daunting when you're dealing with loss and grief, but it can also be motivating and healing. Recently at my mother's funeral, I discussed that all the lessons that she taught me and philosophies, I, told, I talked about how keeping those philosophies alive keeps her alive, keeps her legacy alive. So our loved ones can continue to live through us, they can continue to live through you. So the third lesson in elevation is gratitude. I tell you, Oprah got it right when she told us to write in our gratitude journals, and she invited scholars from all over the world to teach us how to write in those journals, and she advised us to share our thoughts. Well, I like to keep mine in a jar. The picture, I have a picture on my Instagram page that actually shows all the different notes that I write, that I put into the jar, because I like to see my blessings grow. I like to see them visually. I'm also grateful that even though my husband died two months after we wed, I'm grateful that we had eight years together. We were college sweethearts at Delaware State University, and I cherished those two months. I remember when I wanted to push back our wedding because my mother was diagnosed and she had to have emergency surgery prior to our wedding day. And I told Brian, we can't get married without mom there. He looked at me and he said, Courtney, we're going to, we aren't changing our date. Even if we get married right here in this hospital by your mom's bedside, we're getting married on a date we've decided that we chose. He also added that I waited my entire life to marry you. So just two months ago, 
when my mother's health declined and my father gave me a call at my job to tell me that the doctors are saying that your mother is experiencing the stages of death. What does that mean? I didn't know what to make sense of that. So I began to learn about preactive death and anticipatory grief. See, Brian's death made me cherish mom's death. See, I was grateful that I could rush to the hospital. I was grateful that we could take her home to peacefully die. I was also grateful to hold her hand and tell her how much I appreciated and loved and thanked her for being my mom. I was grateful because I compared it to my time with Brian. See, I never said goodbye to him. By the time I was able to reach the, him at the hospital, he was already at the morgue. So my experience with my mom was different. With the help of the hospice nurses, I was able to be part of a process of bathing her and getting her dressed. And I shared this experience with my father, my brother, and other family members. It was beautiful, yet a sad experience. Because I recall washing her clothes during that period and thinking that she would wear it for the last time. But every second I cherished. I cherished it even when she wasn't responsive. And I cherished it even when she had her last breath. See, science supports gratitude. Scientists share that individuals with higher levels of gratitude are more likely to use positive framings in regards to negative events, which will help them engage in a more manageable and meaningful life. Now, forgiveness was also key in my healing. Remember his business partner and friend that accidentally shot him? I could have spent 17 years in anger, but yet, I chose happiness, actually forgiveness. Because science supports forgiveness and gratitude with both positively and, and strongly associated with well-being. So I actually did choose happiness. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm superwoman, that I have superpowers. I just know through the process I've given myself the permission to be human. Because losing loved ones kind of puts you through a roller coaster of emotion. So my life, last life lesson is self-care. I've battled depression in this journey and other hardships. However, self-care is probably my greatest strength. Sometimes that means telling people that I love that what they're saying to me is not very comforting or that I need more help. Matter of fact, I remember my husband's funeral. And a woman that I didn't know, she approached me, and she said, I'm so sorry for your loss. She said to me, you're so beautiful. I appreciated the compliment. She also added, don't worry, you'll find another husband. You can laugh. I now laugh about that story. And I'm glad I can laugh now, but back then it was very hard to hear. Even though her intent might have come from a good place, it was just really hard to hear that back then. As a matter of fact, grief.com provide some real insight on what not to say to someone when grieving. For some reason, my situation did not make their list, but they do provide great tips on what to say. And actually, silence is probably one of my favorite. Silence, just being with that, very, that person. And I think for us, it can be a little frightening because we instinctively want to fix things and help that person, but sometimes silence can actually help the grieving person feel heard. I will tell you that, you know, grief is an individual journey. And what brings you comfort may not bring the next person comfort. So we have to really take cues from those that are grieving. We have to really learn how to be more empathetic. One thing about grief that I've learned is that it makes me crave talking wanting to share and talk things out. I think one of the greatest gifts that my friends have given me has been active listening. Sometimes in order for that to happen, I may have to send them a text or a call to let them know I'm on that roller coaster and they're right there. Another great gift has come out of my new academic home at Georgia College. See, I started my contract August 1st. By August 31st, my mother died. My colleagues at the school, they barely know me. They're still getting to know me. 
But they came into my office and let me know if I wanted to take any time off just to grieve, that they would be there. That gift was one of the greatest gifts that they could ever give me. That gift allows me to be present and fulfilled. I will also say that humor helps. Last night, I spent a wonderful evening with my late husband's friends, and we talked about all these great stories as related to him. That brought me a great deal of comfort. I would tell you also that one of my fondest memories is making my mother smile and laugh on her deathbed. I tell you, humor done responsibly can be a healer. And if you remember one thing from me, I really hope you remember this, that there is no one size fits all to grief. You got to feel your way through. You have to find elements that comfort you. It may be one or two of the things that I've mentioned and also things that I've helped other people. And like the theme of this TEDx Women event, it's about time. And I want to say, speaking of time, I actually wear my late husband's watch. I've been wearing it for 17 years. He wore it when he died. And his watch reminds me about time and about comfort. It reminds me to be present. It reminds me to be more empathetic. It reminds me to make sure that the people that are in my life don't leave without understanding how important they are. Compliments and knowing your value are the two things you're going to experience when you're with me. See, that morning that I left my husband to rush to the newsroom, I thought I would have that evening with him. I never did. Death has taught me that life isn't promised and that you better make sure that people in your life know how important they are. I tell you, Peanuts, the cartoon, happens to be one of my favorite cartoons, starring Charlie Brown, right? And he would reference good grief a lot, often when he was frustrated. I'm going to have my own spin on it. If you find any good in grief, is that it makes us value time. It makes you want to live more, love more. And it's a reminder that time is ticking. See, death motivates us to live, to live a fulfilling life, to live a meaningful life, to live a happy life. And when you're dealing with the nightmare of grief, we must learn to live a life where sometimes we must have to create new dreams, yet still honoring those that touched our lives with passion and purpose. Just know that your time is right now. Thank you.